Hello, everyone, and uh, good afternoon. If you're joining us uh, from the Eastern St Standard Time Zone, good day or good evening, good morning to everyone uh, else. Uh, my name is Nicholas Herman. I'm the Lawrence Day Schoenberg Curator at the Schoenberg Institute for Management Studies, an institute we like to refer to as SIMS. And I'm delighted to uh, welcome you to today's lecture, which is the second in our fall uh, series of uh, online virtual lectures. Um, and today we're going to be hearing from Professors Alexandra Gillespie and Suzanne Conklin Akbari. Uh, and uh, momentarily, I'm going to call on my friend and colleague, Doc Porter, to uh, introduce the two of them. Um, but before we begin today's program, uh, I'd like to just say a few words about our institute and tell you about some of the upcoming uh, events and, and programs we are uh, organizing. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies is a unit of the Kislak Center for Special Collections, Rare Books, and Manuscripts at the University of Pennsylvania. The mission of SIMS is to bring manuscript culture, uh, modern technology, and people together to promote an understanding of our shared intellectual heritage. Simply put, the Institute is a think tank for the study of pre-modern manuscripts in a digital age. To fulfill our mission, we make our resources, programs, and data available to scholars and students around the world. We invite users uh, of all, uh, at all levels to contribute to online projects like the Schoenberg Database of Manuscripts or VizCall, an online collation tool. Uh, we also invite anyone in the world to freely use our manuscript data uh, via our repository, OPEN. Um, and um, you can find out about these and many other projects uh, that we're involved in on our website at schoenberginstitute.org. Now, in addition to making uh, data and images available uh, online, we also seek to bring scholars uh, to Penn to study our manuscripts through a series of programs, including a visiting research fellowship that brings uh, up to three uh, scholars a year to, to our campus for a month to research our manuscripts and also to be involved uh, with us directly in, in digital projects. Um, and we will be opening a call for applications for that fellowship in March. So please take a look on our website and stay tuned for that. We also host the annual Schoenberg Symposium on Manuscript Studies in the Digital Age, which is now in its 14th year. This year's symposium, which will be held November 17th to 19th, is on the topic of law, uh, with a keynote address on November 17th by Professor Elaine Treharn of Stanford University. So please uh, do sign up for that. Uh, and um, there'll be links posted in the chat uh, for, for registration and for more information about the annual symposium next month. Now we also um, uh, publish a journal in print and online that comes out twice a year, Manuscript Studies. And um, the volume uh, six issue two will be out next month. So please keep an eye out for that, it's available uh, online uh, via um, Project Muse uh, for institutions that subscribe and after a one year uh, period, uh, it's available on Scholarly Commons. And we're actively seeking submissions for uh, forthcoming issues. So from fall 2022 and, and beyond. So please get in touch if you think you have an article um, or a shorter uh, annotation that you might wanna contribute to the journal. Uh, and we're also, uh, of course, we host events uh, like today's event. And as I said, this is a monthly uh, lecture series. Next month, we have a symposium, so we won't have a, a standalone lecture, but we're excited to say that uh, on Friday, December 17th, at the same time at noon, uh, we'll be uh, hosting Tara Andrews, uh, who will be speaking to us about uh, the rescue of Armenian historiography and the Chronicle of Matthew of Edessa. So that's December 17th. Uh, at noon. And again, there will be a link in the chat to more information about that. Now, before handing uh, the screen over to Dot Porter, I do have a couple of housekeeping items. Um, just to let you know, we'll be recording uh, the presentation and we will post the video to the Schoenberg Institute YouTube channel as we have done with all our previous uh, online lectures. And um, my colleagues and I will be monitoring the chat for any questions you might have along the way. So please uh, leave those in the chat, uh, questions for our speakers, and we'll be happy to either call on you or read them out to our speakers at the end of their presentation. So thank you. And without further ado, Dot, I will hand the screen over to you. Thank you, Nick. 
Now, it is my great pleasure and indeed an honor uh, to introduce today Suzanne Conklin Akbari and Alexandra Gillespie, who are the co PIs on the Book and the Silk Roads project. Their work on book history is visionary and enlightening, and I'm very excited to hear them talk about it today. Dr. Akbari has a, had a distinguished career, and her work has always addressed the borders and overlaps of culture and technology during the Western Middle Ages, although not only in the West, as you will soon hear. She's currently Professor of Medieval Studies at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. She earned her Master of Arts, MPhil, and PhD from Columbia University and joined the faculty of the University of Toronto in 1995, where she was cross-appointed to the Center for Comparative Literature, the Center for Jewish Studies, the Center for Reformation and Renaissance Studies, and the Institute for Islamic Studies, which I think speaks to her very broad and overlapping interests. She was also a member of the University College. She served as the director of the Center for Medieval Studies at Toronto from 2013 until her departure in 2019, at which time she came to Princeton. Dr. Akbari studies and teaches the literature and history of Europe and the wider Mediterranean region extending into the Islamic world and the Horn of Africa. Her research projects tend to fall into two areas, the philosophical and scientific backgrounds to medieval literature and religious, ethnic and racial borderlines in the Middle Ages. Her first book, Seeing Through the Veil, shows how the metaphor of sight, saying I see to mean I understand, changed during the Middle Ages when new optical theories from the Arabic speaking world transformed science in Europe. Her second book, Idols in the East, shows how, quote, Saracens or Muslims were perceived by Europeans during the time of the Crusades, both in terms of religious difference and in terms of bodily diversity. She has also edited volumes on travel literature, Mediterranean studies and somatic histories, plus the open access collections, How We Write and How We Read. Her most recent book is the Oxford Handbook of Chaucer published in 2020 and co-edited with James Simpson. In addition to her academic work, Dr. Akbari also participates in the public humanities. She is a co-host with Chris Puma of the Spouter In podcast, a podcast about great books, which was nominated in 2020 for a Canadian podcast award for outstanding arts program. Dr. Gillespie's career is no less distinguished. She is principal of the University of Toronto, Mississauga, vice president of the University of Toronto, a faculty member in the University of Toronto, Mississauga Department of English and Drama, and the University of Toronto Department of English Center for Medieval Studies and Collaborative Program in Book History and Print Culture, which again gives you an idea of her broad range of interests. She is a fellow of Victoria College and Trinity College as well. In addition to all of that, she is also the director of the Old Books New Science Lab, which has received support from the Mellon Foundation, the SSHRC, and at the University of Toronto, the Center for Medieval Studies, the Office of the Vice President Research, UTM, and the Jackman Humanities Institute. The Old Book New Science Lab brings together undergraduate research assistants, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, and scholars with interest in new scientific and global approaches to medieval book history, digital text editing and computational approaches to humanities research, and medieval literary studies, especially work on form, affect, and historical phenomenology. Dr. Gillespie earned her Master of Science, master, pardon me, Master of Studies, Master of Arts, and DPhil degrees from the University of Oxford, during which, or after, I'm not entirely sure, she worked for, in the early years of the Parker on the Web project. Um, that was the effort to digitize the manuscripts of Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, before her arrival in Toronto. Dr. Gillespie's research is concerned with medieval and early modern texts and books, especially the shift from manuscript to print, the relationship between book history, literary criticism, and literary theory, the global development of early book technologies, and digital and non-destructive scientific approaches to the study of pre-modern books. In addition to the Silk Roads project, Dr. Gillespie's current research project, Chaucer's Books, offers a new framework for bibliographical inquiry that is based on a reading of Chaucer's work. In this book, Dr. Gillespie argues that in the space of his literary texts, Chaucer explores ideas about experiential versus abstract knowledge that are familiar to him from medieval philosophy that lie behind modern approaches to, um, 
facticity and that shape medieval and modern attitudes to books themselves. Her other current project, John Stowe's books, catalogs marginalia from nearly 100 medieval manuscripts and pre-Reformation printed books annotated, owned, or handled by Stowe. She is also, um, she is working on a book that uses this data to assess the importance of his manuscript collections to the history of Tudor and medieval England. Professor Akbari and Professor Gillespie are co-PIs on the Book on the Silk Roads project, which is funded by the Andrew Mellon, um, W. Mellon Foundation. We are going to hear a lot more about them. I think you know that they are exactly the right people to be doing this project, and I'm going to turn it over for them to them now. Ani Bujou, um, thank you so much, Dot, for that generous um, introduction, which we really appreciate. As you just heard, Alexandra Gillespie, Nadezhda Nikos, <clears throat> and I greet you today from a room of Lylehurst, which is the 19th century principal's residence at the University of Toronto's Mississauga campus, where I have the pr pr privilege of living with my family. The window that's casting light on me looks out over the Missinihi, uh, if I can have the next slide, a word meaning trusting creek in Ojibwe, a river which the French and British called the credit, because at its mouth they traded with indigenous peoples who for thousands of years had traveled and stewarded its waters and the lands around it. I start with the Missinihi because I'm on the traditional lands of the Wendat and the Seneca in a house by the waters and on treaty territory, some of it unceded, of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. I want to acknowledge this and to recommit to listening to the truth that comes before reconciliation, to reciprocity, to being good kin with local nations, the Mississaugas of the Credit particularly, but also all the indigenous peoples I'm fortunate to learn with and from in Turtle Island and around the globe. Starting here by the Missinihi, I'm mindful that the work that Suzanne and I are so grateful to share with you today, and our thanks to Lynn Ransom and all the others here at Penn for this opportunity. This work is richly informed by the learning that local contexts enable. What I learned from my context is that that which is immediate and local, this place here, this moment now, is always entangled in a complex of histories whose impact upon and benefit, but also cost to the present can sometimes go unacknowledged. The history of this place here was shaped in powerful ways by its immediate environment, a great river carved out of the land by Ice Age glaciers as they retreated 10,000 years ago. This river was an important place for cultural and material exchange among First Peoples and later between First Peoples and newcomers. It um, supported trusting and reciprocal relations, but it also witnessed trust betrayed as local traditions gave way to the global force of belligerent and genocidal European colonialism. The motto of the Mississauga campus of U of T plays on our situation here on the Missinihi and invokes that idea of trust. Tantum nobis creditum, so much has been entrusted to us. Suzanne and I and our co-PI, we have another one who's not here, Sean Meikle, the Director of Information Technology at U of T's libraries. Our teams led by Jessica Lockhart, Melissa Morton and Rachel DeCrash set out on the project we're describing today, 30 months ago, with generous funding from the Mellon Foundation, as you've heard. These funds were entrusted to us so we could work together with others to prepare the ground for and to begin to help build a global research network. And the next slide has my, uh, uh, my we, our, <laughs> next slide has our website. Organizing this pro project were lots of old books, handwritten or hand printed rather than industrially manufactured. That's a, that's a hard limit there. Made and sometimes moved along the famous Silk Road that connected China and East Asia to the Mediterranean Sea and the European continent beyond it from before the beginning of the first millennium right through to the modern period. We chose the term Silk Road precisely because it captures something powerfully pre-imagined for non-experts who encounter our project. It's an easy hook, if you like. But we chose it for lots of other reasons. We were conscious that it is a freighted term. The singular overland trade route that it describes is a simplification imagined through the most luxurious commodity, woven silk, of the many commodities that traveled that route by camel or horse in the pre-modern period. The term Silk Road was coined in 1877 by the German geographer Ferdinand von Richthofen, who was uncle to the First World War German pilot, the Red Baron. Now that's a connection I make, not just because you can now all start humming the Snoopy song to yourself, if you know the song about the Red Baron, and Christmas is indeed coming, um, I can see it in the shops, 
Um, but because von Richthofen's expeditions to China, his reports and atlases, his particular preoccupation with China's economic resources and commodities, coal, silk, were examples and tools of a 19th century German expansionism that because it clashed hard with an ambitious British imperialism that was at just that same moment, late 1870s, leading British settlers along the Credit River to break faith with the First Nations here as they built the house that I'm sitting in. All that history is of course directly connected to the Great War. Um, we were well aware of this when we chose the term. We were well aware of the redeployment of the Silk Road imaginary by the Chinese government to describe their 2013 One Belt, One Road or Belt and Road initiative, a pattern of deliberate investment by um, the, the so-called rising China in countries along the same corridor for economic development mapped by von Richthofen. But the savvy spellers among you will have noticed that we added a scholarly S to our historical Silk Roads as a way to elaborate different older stories, even as we were conscious of these highly political modern ones. The S in Silk Roads is there to recall not one road, but many, shifting over centuries, next slide please, including the many sea routes linking the Pacific and Indian Oceans, the Persian Gulf and the Mediterranean Sea. Here is an image of some of these routes. This is a map from an exhibition that our project just opened in collaboration with the Aga Khan Museum here in Toronto, as well as the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library in the Royal Ontario Museum. Suzanne will be returning to this exhibition in some detail later in our paper, but here I'll just say that our use of the term Silk Roads is meant to capture not just the imagination, but the idea of any old book as a carrier of knowledge about, as well as a representative product of, networks of exchange, that have always linked people across national boundaries, languages, and faith traditions. Our project is about books from the Silk Roads, and there are some of them in this exhibition. So if we can jump to the next slide, please. There's a picture of the exhibition. There are some books in there, but this term Silk Roads, and they're from the Silk Roads, but the term Silk Roads is meant to register something larger too. Histories of books that are rooted in particular locales, but that have translocal global significance. <clears throat> and so, one of the objects in our exhibit is a post-conquest Mexican baptismal register for indigenous children, soft bound in leather in a presumably Iberian style that its makers probably unknowingly inherited from centuries of craft practices transmitted from and between Coptic and Islamic and Christian bookmakers. Suzanne and I decided that my job here at the beginning of our paper was to provide a simple introduction to this project and a few examples of our research findings. I don't think I've done that yet. I, I haven't gone for simplicity. So let me do it a little bit now. Our team, Melissa, Jessica, our lab assistant, Amy Earhart Sheldon, spent many hours this week mapping the locales that connect to form the global research network that is the most important result of our funded work. So we're doing work on particular books, but it's the network itself that, that is our most important um, build, if you like, from this project. These stars, um, appropriately, are some of the principal locations of the books that have been orienting our research. But if we go to the next slide, lay it onto that are the locations of the collaborators who we've been working with. And finally, next slide, um, in green there are the historical regions of our and our collaborators' research interests. As this map suggests, some of the books we've been working with are in the locales in which they were originally produced and used. For example, the Islamic collections of the Great Mosque of Cairo, next slide, where we have initiated what we hope will be post-pandemic work, we haven't been able to do it during the pandemic, with our collaborator Jonathan Brockhoff of Penn State, and through him, the Cairo curatorial team. And um, what we want to work on is first millennium covers of Cairo manuscripts that were separated from their text blocks in the, um, in the 20th century. And uh, a shout out to, to Doc Porter here, because we think one of the tools we'll use to do some of this work um, is VizCol in Toronto's build on top of that Viz Codex. Next slide. Another example of a book in its original locale is this, a birch bark manuscript copied in Sharada script from an archeological site in Pakistan. It was rescued in 2020 from antiquity hunters by an archeologist forum led by Muzaffa Ahmad, who contacted our collaborator, and indeed has, we hope, become one of our own collaborators, contacted our collaborator, Jason Nealis at Wilfrid Laurier University for support. 
Um, and Musafa Ahmad and his colleagues have determined that most of the other manuscripts found at the site have already been sold on the illegal antiquities market and taken out of Pakistan. However, the majority of the books that we've been working on, and, and uh, Suzanne will have more to say about this as we go along, because um, this has partly got to do with pandemic contexts. The majority of them have been moved. They've been dislodged and then resituated away from their original locale by trade, conflict, exploration, colonialism, globalization, the black market and antiquities. This is, uh, next slide, a birch bark manuscript from Northwestern India or Pakistan, again in Sharada script, that was recently discovered in a family attic in Vermont and donated to Williams College Chapman Library in Massachusetts. And we've had the privilege of working with Anne Peel at Williams, Mary French and Bex Caswell Olson at the Northeast Document Conservation Center and folks from Harvard University Libraries. And together with them, um, we've succeeded, or in a way they've succeeded, in carbon dating the manuscript to the 16th or early 17th century. And then building, if we can just jump to the next slide, a 3D data model of its very fragile form using micro CT is one of the first steps in what Williams is planning as a, next slide, multi-year investigative and conservation project. And this is them doing some conservation work. One of our governing assumptions in our project as we've approached books like this one is that our work can be vitally enhanced by new technologies and new or newly applied conservation and natural science methods. So a CT of a book using a machine that usually looks for evidence of disorder in the human body can tell you a lot about the ordered and disordered physical state of a book like this, which is a choir book from Western University Library in London, Ontario. And a micro CT scanner, next slide, Oh, actually, we should wait for a minute. Oh, no, good. Um, a micro CT scanner can tell you even more, breaking the book into thousands of slices at the scale of a micron, revealing the grain of its wood, the weave of the threads that hold it together, the metal and the inks that copy its texts, next slide, which is so much denser than the carbon substrate um, that they're written on that they make a delicate mesh of letters separate from the book under imaging. Now this is very fun and also informative work. CT is particularly useful for seeing parts of books like sewing or lacing structures or bits of reused manuscripts used in boards that are obscure from the eye. It's allowed scholars to read the lost text of unopenable books, including Herculaneum papyri and Dead Sea Scrolls. But for us, there's a bit more to this. Methods that focus attention on the material composition, the engineering and re-engineering of books offer, we believe, important new ways of encountering the knowledge about the world that is contained within books. Um, these are methods that are not unencumbered by disciplinary biases, but they are differently encumbered from, for example, philological research or close looking or close reading. Philology with its focus on expertise bounded by particular languages, often regionally specific um, arts and texts. When humanist methods meet scientific ones around the book, um, the results are quite different conversations about them. Conversations that can connect objects across space and time in different ways as they provide rich new information about a specific object. Before I hand to Suzanne, I'll illustrate this point by way of our research on this manuscript, a textile bound paper and paperboard Sharada script um, Bhagavad Gita manuscript from Kashmir. It's a few centuries old. It's now at the Thomas Fisher Rear Book Library in downtown Toronto. And it was pointed out to us by one of our collaborators, um, it's curator Tim Perry. The only thing known about it when we started on this book was from the Fisher catalog, which had been taken from a pasted note on the cover, um, Bhagwat Gita, about 600 years old with pictures. The manuscript hadn't come to the attention of the Sanskrit scholars and South Asianists at the University of Toronto, and there are a lot of them, and they're quite brilliant. And meantime, our project team had no training in South Asian languages or in fact book binding. And yet the first time we examined this manuscript, we were struck by the pentagonal flat binding and the fact that being attached to the right board, it was the reverse of the design for um, more typical Islamic style flat bindings, because of course you read these scripts in different directions. And that became a starting point for us. So did, next slide, the beautiful fabric, which seems to have been the original covering for the boards. Um, our director of research, Jess Lockhart, again, wanted to know whether this fabric extended around the entirety of the structure, even the flat, um, but it wasn't possible to see because it was completely covered by this protective layer. So we pursued our research on two fronts. Uh, next slide, Jess took photographs. There she is doing that, including microscopic ones, which is one of these. And you can see the results on the next slide. 
Um, she did this for all the pages of the manuscript as well as the fabric. And we reached out to Luther Albrock, a professor in South Asian religions at Toronto. Luther immediately identified the script as Sharada, um, indicating that the book was likely made in Kashmir. And with further work, he was able to identify the contents of the manuscript, not just the Holy Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, but a range of devotional texts devoted to both Vishnu and Shiva and a poem in honor of the river that runs through Kashmir. The artwork and the style of the book, next slide, identify it as being from the Mughal period, we think from the 17th century, though possibly later. And Jess noted of the artwork that Arjuna, the human prince, whose ethical deliver and conversation with his guide, Lord Krishna, forms the story of the Bhagavad Gita, is represented in Mughal dress, even perhaps with passing resemblance to Darashiko, the oldest son of the Mughal em emperor Shah Jahan in the mid 17th century, who sponsored the translation of many Hindu works into Persian during his life. So that was the first front of research. Meanwhile, our lab team was working with engineers from Giovanni Grisselli's geomechanics group at Toronto. With them, we conducted a micro CT scan of the book. That's a picture of the cradle that was built for the book by one of our team, Alice Sharp. The next slide shows the book being scanned. A little moving gift there. Um, and then the next slide shows the images as they start to emerge. Our analysis of the data produced by this process revealed that there were indeed layers of fabric under what we could see. And here's a next slide is a video showing this. Need to just wait a moment and you'll see, here we go, this angle which enabled us to demonstrate that. And also one of our key images, next slide, um, also enabled us to see this and this 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 reading a CT um, of a book is I, I'm told a bit like reading a CT of a brain you have to learn how to do it but what we're seeing there and I think Melissa's moving the cursor is um, is the fabric extending around under the cover and finally textile expert Rosemary Krill of Victoria and Albert Museum um, used Jess's photos to identify this fabric as Indian mushroom fabric likely from Gujarat this story about the Fisher Bhagavad Gita is about a book in its particular and localized historical contexts, as well as the global institutional disciplinary and technological forces and structures that brought it to Toronto and then under our scrutiny. It's also a story about trust and reciprocity. So much has been entrusted to us, goes the motto I quoted. Um, so much has been trusted to us as inhabitants of these lands and this world. Um, as students and stewards of the knowledge contained by the objects we've inherited from those who came before us. And in our case, um, and our, I mean, Suzanne and me and all of our team, as collaborators who rely on those much more expert than we are, scholars, curators and conservators, uh, and scientists from universities, galleries, libraries and museums around the world, and also the members of the local and diasporic communities to whom these objects are particularly tied by histories, languages, and faith traditions. No single scholar or expert can produce a global history of the book. What we hope is that a global network built on trust can. And with that hope, I hand to Suzanne. Thanks, Alex. And let me add my thanks to yours, um, to Dot for the beautiful, kind introduction, and to Nick and to Lynn and everyone else for, um, for having invited us. Alex has given you a wonderful introduction to the book in the Silk Roads Project, emphasizing the extent to which our work is collaborative and highly networked. Over the next few minutes, I want to build on Alex's remarks, illustrating our working methodology with a few specific examples from the past year, with the aim of demonstrating the suppleness of the research network that we've built. You've already heard a bit from Alex about our way of working. Each individual book, whether the Williams Birch Bark or the Fisher Bhagavad Gita, has a circle of researchers gathered around it one or more members of the core Book of the Silk Roads team, subject area specialists who are familiar with the language and specific region where the object was produced, curators and conservators, engineers and technicians with expertise in micro CT, proteomic analysis, or other techniques. The core team members coordinate and contribute to the work, but the whole circle is necessary to work with the object so that it can tell its story. As our project developed, however, we found that we began to think laterally. What would happen if, instead of just having a series of circles gathered around each particular object, each particular book, what if we started to think across clusters, with a focus on writing substrates, for example, or on the textiles used to bind and adorn the book? This line of thinking quickly led us to birch bark, which you see here. You can go to the next one, Melissa. For well over a year, and maybe two, we've been reflecting on the idea of doing a birch bark workshop where we could explore the use of this writing substrate in the three regions where we find it, 
South and Central Asia, particularly Kashmir and Tibet, Northern Europe, particularly Scandinavia and Northern Russia, and third, the Great Lakes and Eastern Woodlands regions of North America. We were aware that planning a workshop of this sort would be complex and would require us to assemble at least three teams or circles of researchers gathered around particular objects, and then to facilitate conversations that would work in two directions. First, we would seek to share research methods and conservation techniques that would be valuable and common across all three groups. And second, we would need to focus specifically on the use of birch bark in each particular region. Each of these we knew would be distinctive, not only due to the different language and scripts in which the manuscripts were written, but also by the very different historical and cultural circumstances of each region and people. In other words, we wanted to do this kind of lateral work, but we were aware that it would be challenging and complex. That said, we knew we were well situated to carry out intricate network projects and to be self-reflective in the process, oriented toward building our research community in ways that would be at once healthy and productive. This is particularly visible in one of the recent publications of the Old Books New Science Lab. Next slide. <laughs> Melissa, just forward them when you see the prompts in the, in the text, okay? This is particularly visible in one of our recent publications called One Love Heart at a Time, The Language of Emoji and the Building of Affective Community in the Digital Medieval Studies Environment, which was published in a special issue on virtual spaces in Digital Humanities Quarterly. This was an opportunity to turn the mirror on ourselves, to understand more fully the nature of our collaboration and to consider both what this mode of working enables and what it obscures. Our main means of communication is Slack, combined with Google Docs and Google Slides to enable us to write together and share images. We studied our patterns of channel usage and growth, observing what new channels appeared and which became vestigial. We also took note of the ways in which the Slack environment blurs the lines between work and leisure. For example, Slack cats. The lab cats were not only featured in the daily cat channel, but were also incarnate in a series of custom emoji seen here at left. Seriously though, we asked ourselves whether the supportive affective community we had generated and sustained over Slack, this very personal environment, was entirely a good thing. Was it possible that the blurring of work and leisure was allowing a kind of creeping takeover of our personal spaces? I described this self-reflective process in order to highlight two aspects of our research community. First, our highly collaborative way of working. We even had a Slack channel called Slack Meta Channel in which we wrote the article about our Slack usage. And second, our self-reflective, self-critical practice, which has allowed us to adapt to changing circumstances in a supple way. Here at right, you see our Slack chat from last night when Melissa Morton and I, uh, plus Jess, Miriam, and Amy, um, were working on the PowerPoint you're watching right now. So I said we were self-reflective, so you see an example. Our working methods mediated by a range of digital tools make us well situated to do the kind of lateral work I described previously, cutting across a range of object, object specific clusters that are united by some shared common feature, whether it be a writing substrate such as birch bark or some other material component of book bindings. We decided to think more about birch bark to reflect on how best to approach it. We needed to wait. We were ready, however, to take on textiles and manuscripts. Beginning with a small tentative seminar at the Getty Museum in February of 2019, just before the pandemic lockdown began, we came up with a plan to do a workshop on textiles and manuscripts across a range of traditions. At first, we imagined that this would be a small gathering, maybe 40 people or so. We soon discovered that there was tremendous interest out there, and the event developed into something much bigger than we had imagined. Led by Melissa Morton, we developed a substantial online resource featuring a series of pre-recorded online videos leading to a two-day conference attended by over 500 people. You can see how our working methodology with a circle of scholars gathered around each object was integrated into a more complex structure so that we could talk across our various subject areas, sharing common knowledge while still retaining the necessary depth of knowledge in each specific field. For each subject area, we prepared a pre-recorded video, 20 to 30 minutes in length, which workshop attendees were expected to watch ahead of time. At the time of the workshop itself, we opened each session with a brief summary of key takeaways from each video before turning to a group discussion. We wanted to make sure that each session was clearly distinct from the pre-recorded video. For example, here's a view of the discussion session on textiles and Syriac manuscripts, building on a pre-recorded video by Georgios Budalis, Aaron Butts, and Thelma Thomas, with additional commentary by Nancy Turner. Here we see the circle of specialists who gather around the object of study, working with it so that the book can tell its story. These include a manuscript binding specialist, a researcher on Syriac manuscript culture, and an expert on Coptic textiles and the material culture of the region, plus an expert conservator. Similarly, here you see the session on Armenian uh, textiles and Armenian manuscripts, featuring Brian Keane, Sylvie Marianne, and Hawk Kacharian with commentary by Barry Flood. 
Again, a combination of manuscript specialists and textile experts, including a master photographer whose knowledge of Armenian textiles is unparalleled. I wish I had time to describe each one of these at length, including textiles and Ethiopian manuscripts with Aob Durlo, Michael Gerbers, and Kristen Windmiller Luna. Aob and Michael are working on a database on textiles and Ethiopian manuscripts, a project that was spurred on by our workshop. Here we see a session on textiles and Chinese uh, manuscripts and books, not just manuscripts, because we're often talking about printed books in this period in China, building on a pre-recorded video by Michelle Wong and Martin Hydra with commentary in this session by Stephen Chow and Amanda Goodman. In this case, we had not one, but two circles of experts gathered around the objects. Originally, we had a video recorded by Zabina Schmidtke and Karen Shepper, but because we had to move the date of the workshop to avoid conflict with the CAU2 CAUT Center of the University of Toronto for academic freedom issues, neither Sabina nor Karen were able to join the rescheduled live event. Therefore, we had a second session on Islamic manuscripts. This one focused on a different region, where Sabina and Karen had provided an overview of Islamic book formats before turning particularly to textiles and Yemeni manuscripts. Those in the second live session, featuring Paul Hepworth, Alison Ota, and Felice Shakir Philip, turned to textiles and Ottoman and Persian manuscripts. This session was also recorded, providing a double resource in the particularly rich area of Islamic manuscript culture on our workshop website. The series of six pre-recorded videos plus panels concluded with a circle on Kashmiri manuscripts, including the birch bark manuscript seen here, as well as the beautiful Bhagavad Gita devotional miscellany that Alex described earlier, featuring Jasdeep Singh Dillon, Luther Obrak, and Maraka Sardar. Finally, having established these six concentrated areas of research on textiles and manuscripts, Syriac, Armenian, Ethiopian, Chinese, Islamic, Kashmiri, we began to cut across research areas. This part of the workshop included not only introductory and concluding overviews by Alex and myself, but also a synthesis by Melissa, uh, Melissa Morton, a codecology expert and lead organizer of our textile workshop, plus an in-depth account by textile expert Rosemary Krill. Rosemary had also, as Alex mentioned, been a consultant to several of these focused circles, but here she gave an account that cut across the various fields from her vantage point as a specialist in textiles. The webpage remains as a resource with shared bibliography as well as the videos I've mentioned. We hope to add more subject areas to the six already represented and perhaps turn this into a physical book as well as a web resource. I give you this account of our working methods, our fundamental circle approach to our research on each object of study our working methods within the Old Books New Science Lab, which is highly collaborative and self-reflective, and our recent efforts to cut across specific research fields, gathering together a series of circles focused on different codicological traditions in order to develop a synoptic view of textiles and manuscripts. In other words, I've been looking back at what we've already done. But where will we go next? In order to turn toward the future, it might be helpful for both me and Alex to give a sense of our view of the research field, what we bring to it, and what we'd like to accomplish. My own training is in literary history and intellectual history with a focus on European vernacular and Latin literature. Early on though, I became interested in literary, philosophical, scientific, and religious traditions, especially in the context of Mediterranean studies. This interest in the multilingual Mediterranean, extending west into Iberia as well as east into the Latin kingdom of Jerusalem and beyond, naturally led to an interest in the regional connectivity that links the Eastern Mediterranean to the Horn of Africa, and medieval Ethiopia became another area of study. In other words, I was interested in a global approach to the Middle Ages, but specifically in terms of connectivity, entanglements, and networks. Not a generic global view of the past, but one that emphasized points of connection, contact, and exchange. I didn't know much about book history. Luckily, Alex knows a lot about it, and she's taught me a little bit over the years we've been working together. Over to you, Alex. Um, I, I shan't comment for reasons of... Um, of of Suzanne's modesty on how much she's taught me over the years. As for me, how I end up here, I came to, um, to the study of books, just books generally, and something of a fit of peak, which those of you who know will not be surprised to learn. I chose my topic after a class in one of my first year courses on textual criticism and bibliography at Oxford, where the, the instructor had presented what I would call the usual story about the history of the book. We've all encountered the story in one form or another. Another, It's simple and triumphalist. It's centered on Christian Europe, and it's a story of technological and societal progress from the tablet and scroll to the biblical codex of late antiquity to the early modern printing press of the Gutenberg Bible to today's digital age, each technological change ushering in a new way of thinking. It had and has tremendous currency, thanks in part to the work of a much more famous Toronto professor than I, 
um, uh, Marshall McLuhan, who in the 1960s offered statements like this one for pop, uh, popular consumption. In this case, I'm quoting from an interview he gave to Playboy magazine. The advent of printing in Western Europe, he suggested, was, quote, directly responsible for the rise of such disparate phenomena as nationalism, the Reformation, the assembly line and its offspring, the Industrial Revolution, the whole concept of causality, Cartesian and Newtonian concepts of the universe, perspective and art, narrative chronology and literature, and a psychological mode of introspection or inner direction, close quote. Back in the 1990s, my first objection to this narrative, I had lots, but my first one um, was that of a student of medieval uh, English literatures and cultures. If this was the prevailing idea about what books were and why they mattered, as I was being taught to believe, I was alarmed. The narrative's focus on the Gutenberg or post-Gutenberg period ignored, I thought, and erased um, thousands of years of very bookish history. And so I set out to make that point um, by showing in my DFL and a subsequent book that in England, the poet Geoffrey Chaucer and the book producers at work in the century before printing inherited and then adapted and reinscribed ideas about books and ways of making them without which the work of someone like William Caxton, the printer, is in fact unintelligible. But even as I began this research and, and, and you know, formed the foundation of my career, I was aware that an even stronger objection to the Gutenberg myth existed and that relied on um, spatial rather than temporal reasoning. If printing, which is after all just a way of making books, of facilitating reading and learning, if it was so specifically transformational, if it brought about the conditions of Western modernity directly, then why was only Western civilization so transformed, transformed in this particular way by printing? Gutenberg, Gutenberg's Bible was, of course, the not, for, not the first book printed using movable type. Um, the, that honor goes to this book, a Buddhist, uh, if we can just have the next slide. This book, a Buddhist teaching test from Korea known as the Jiski, um, which was printed in 1377, 75 years before Gutenberg set up shop. And lying behind this movable type book were hundreds of years of other East Asian block printing traditions. And in the next slide, you'll see the famous printed diamond sutra dated to 868, from the library cave at Dunhuang in China. This is the first dated printed book. The version of book history I was offered in that one class at Oxford is a familiar one, but it's also one that denigrates, ignores, and even erases all those cultural traditions of history keeping and bookmaking, which do not support its narrative. And it's a narrative that really acknowledges its own foundation in colonial and imperial violence. Consider, for example, the screenfold books of Mesoamerica. Um, the next slide should show you a picture of one. Um, the Codice Maya de Mexico, one of only four pre-Columbian Mayan codices known to have survived the colonial era, the only one still in Mexico. Three more were carried back to Europe along with other New World loot. The rest were destroyed. And if you think about how that changes the history of the book, they were destroyed in actions like the book burning Diego de Landa describes in the Yucatan in 1562. We found a large number of books in these characters, and as they contained nothing, which were not to be seen as superstition and lies of the devil, we burned them all, which they regretted to an amazing degree, and which caused them much affliction. The Western-centric narrative of global book history upholds the supremacy of writing over orality, of phonetic alphabets over, uh, over other forms of writing, of Christianity over other religions, of European languages over other languages, as it associates Gutenberg's print culture with modernity and indeed with human civilization. This narrative in the West um, also leaves many lost books, not just the books that were stolen or destroyed in the service of Western imperialism and colonialism, but books, and we've been talking about these a lot, that have been displaced from the community's best place to understand and appreciate them. And that's how my history, my fit of peak, um, found me um, in the old books, New Science Lab, and as co PI on the book in the Silk Roads, um, desiring to, to, and believing that we need to work with others to resituate books and uncover their meanings, to read their diverse texts and scripts alongside their materials, their physical structure, their layers of accretion. We need to marshal innovative and interdisciplinary approaches. And above all, we need to marshal a collaborative and a global perspective. Over back to you, Suzanne. Thanks, Alex. Um, in the last several minutes of our talk today, I'd like to return to the motivating principle of our approach to book history and to the medieval past in general. 
That is the relationship of and the tension between the local and the global. I can illustrate this principle best through an account of our most recent project, an exhibition at the Aga Khan Museum called Hidden Stories, Books Along the Silk Roads. This is a project that has taken up a significant proportion of our core team's time over the last nine months, but it's one that we've been delighted to participate in because it's allowed us to carry out one of the key objectives of our project, that is to carry out high level research, which could also be translated into a public facing form. We wanted to make sure that our research and the stories we want to tell about the pre-modern interconnected past were getting out into the world and that we in turn were learning from and being informed by the responses of the communities we serve. The exhibition opened last week on October 9th, and the next few slides give you some views of the space and the objects that are gathered there. Here you see the entryway to the exhibition at right and at left, uh, lower left, a pair of objects that are, so to speak, in conversation. Two leaves from a Mishnah or oral Torah manuscript preserved in the Cairo Geniza, and a block printed Buddhist prayer sheet preserved in the so-called library cave at Dunhuang in Western China. These two objects, each one dated by its maker, uh, 1041 CE for the Mishnah leaves, 947 CE for the Buddhist prayer sheet, give a sense of the range of possibilities in the form of the book. One is on paper, one on parchment, one in Chinese, one in Hebrew, one printed, one written by hand. Both were preserved under remarkable circumstances, created more than a thousand years ago, and both of them entered into colonial collections around the turn of the 20th century. Each of the objects in this exhibition has a story to tell, anchored by the wall map you see here at top, which gives an overview of land and sea routes of travel and exchange. There's also a mini exhibit um, below, which um, uh, gives an over, oh, sorry, uh, nested within the larger show, focused solely on book bindings um, seen in the case um, that's um, there at, uh, below. We also show a wide range of book formats, not just the codex from locations across Asia, Europe, and Africa, but also scrolls or poti, uh, scrolls and poti or palm leaf format manuscripts. Some manuscripts are tiny, meant for individual devotional use. Others are large, like the massive antiphoner or music book that requires four people to pick it up and would have enabled a group of performers to sing in harmony. QR codes in the exhibition bring selected objects to the various senses of the visitor, playing the music on the page, while some objects are paired, inviting the visitor to eavesdrop on their conversations. Still other objects bring out the relationship of the book and the body where texts are written on textiles in a wide range of formats, uh, including a left that was a, a whole, an entire Quran written on a beautiful, luxurious green textile. Here though, in the closing section of the exhibition, focused on intercultural and interfaith crosswords, you'll see our old friend uh, below at right, the Bhagavad Gita devotional miscellany from Kashmir. We make it visible in multiple ways in this exhibition, retaining the intense focus on the single object that is the hallmark of the Book on the Silk Roads project. A wall graphic shows a blow up of the same page to which the book itself is opened, while additional information on this object is available through our digital, digital exhibit. Finally, the book is also on view in the micro CT area of the exhibition, along with three other selected volumes from the show. Here you see the place where we most explicitly translate the research we do into a public facing mode. Two videos are on offer, both of them silent to avoid disturbing visitors in the gallery, including those listening to the music channel through the QR code that I mentioned earlier. The one at left provides an overview of micro CT technology and its application to book history, while the one at right offers, sorry, the one above uh, uh, provides an overview of micro CT technology and its application to book history, while the one below offers a series of scans of the four books on display in the gallery but there's even more. We've also produced slightly longer videos, these ones with audio to go on our digital exhibit site, providing additional resources for public outreach and education, including K through 12. We believe that this public facing dimension is essential to the success of our project. If we don't communicate to a wider public what we're doing and why it might be valuable to take stock of the pre-modern past, we would be failing our communities in a really profound way. Our public outreach extends to the opening night red carpet thread, which is coming up in a second. There it is. Um, made by James Sargon, whose work on the micro CT team, along with Jessica Lockhart, has been transformational. I can't emphasize enough the extent to which our work on this project is shared, is collaborative, and also the passion and dedication that our team brings to their work. Um, it is truly a labor of love uh, that people have been carrying out, which is particularly evident on the project's digital site. And I encourage you to take a look at it using the link seen here. Created by digital humanities pedagogy specialist and medievalist Alexandra Bolintinianu, this site will continue to be expanded over the coming months, remaining available as an online resource for at least three years following the close of the in-person exhibition at the end of February. Finally, I want to highlight the connection between the in-person exhibition and the digital exhibit. 
It was never our intention for the digital platform to simply reproduce what appears in the museum. Instead, we wanted to provide a complement or a sibling to the in-person show, so that while the in-person experience offers something that no digital version can, the digital exhibit also does things that the museum cannot. For example, here you see it left a cluster of writing implements with a wall graphic showing a court atelier scene where many of these tools are in use. The digital exhibit actually juxtaposes these objects with an image of the court atelier scene, so that if you click on objects in the scene, you find them labeled, pen case, ink pot, paper burnishing, and so on, right beside the same writing implements shown in the exhibition, here in their full triple IF glory. Similarly, at right, we see a manuscript painting of Alexander the Great in a tree pavilion, luxuriously detailed, far too small for the human eye. The QR code, though, takes you to a page on the website where, again, the image lives in its high resolution glory, together with resources on the figure of Alexander the Great across cultures in Asia, Europe, and Africa. The website features additional video resources of our team and our collaborators at the Aga Khan Museum, Western University, Griselli, Griselli's Geomechanics Group at the University of Toronto, and others. And importantly, the website lists our collaborators. I mean, just look at this, look at the, this, this incredible scope. It takes a village, as they say, um, to produce an exhibition as much as to raise a child. In closing, I want to point toward the future. I mentioned earlier that we've long wanted to do a workshop on birch bark, cutting across subject specific areas in a way that would be similar to what we accomplished with the workshop on textiles and manuscripts last June. But we held back and waited, which was the right thing to do. We now know more about how to approach this work, and in particular, we know to start with the land. I said earlier that our project was both local and global, that the local and global were in a relationship, and that they were also in tension. There are many ways in which I could contextualize this relationship, this tension, but today I just want to talk about how we ground our work. I'm currently based at the Institute for Advanced Study, working and living on Lanapoking, the traditional and unceded territory of the Lenape, also called Delaware or Munsee people. Alex is based at the University of Toronto Mississauga on the lands of the Mississaugas of the New Credit. We understand that we have to begin with the land we're on and the relationships that flow from that fact in the work we do. I won't take time to go into this today, but for me, this work has entailed building relationships with Munsee Lenape communities now living in Ontario and Wisconsin, as well as those here on Lenapoking, the Round Po and Nanticoke. Having a relationship to the land also involves language learning. I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to co-organize a gathering to take place in a few weeks on Muncie language and history. In other words, we have to begin with the land, the relationships that flow from it, and the layered history of local places in order to do our work in a good way, with a good heart and a good mind. Intentions matter, and so do actions. And this brings me back to Birch Park. We're now beginning to have a clearer sense of how to approach this work, how to be at once global and local. If we had organized a Birch Park workshop a few years ago, it would have looked like this. We would have divided it up into two days, a half day on each of three geographical areas, plus maybe another half day to talk specifically about conservation. We would have grounded our work on cutting edge scientific approaches to birch bark conservation and restoration. It would have been fine. But now we have a different sense of how to approach the objects we study and the living material of which they're made. We want to approach them and the people who have relationships to them with respect and in a deliberate way. We do not want to be extractive. Instead, we want to begin with the land that we are on. We want to begin with the birches that grow by the Missinihi, called in English the Credit River, up in Mississauga, where we'll hold that workshop next spring. As I get ready for that workshop, I will be on Lenapoking, where these birch trees lie. Alex and I will be in these two different places, and our fellow researchers will be in still other locations. But each of us will be attentive to the land that we are on, the responsibilities and relationships that flow from it, and our work will, accordingly, be different. We want to be open to the global, and we are aware that the only way to do that work is collaboratively. At the same time, we want always to be attentive to the local and to the earth beneath the soles of our feet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne and Alexandra. Um, we can do, we have actually quite a lot of time. We have half an hour for questions and answers. If you have a question, um, please put it Put it in the chat and I will um, read it to our speakers and they can answer it. Or if you would rather, uh, you can raise your hand um, using the reactions, there's a raised hand, and then I'll ask you to unmute and, um, and then you can ask your question. So our first question, thank you, is from Lisa Fagan Davis. 
Uh, Lisa asks, can you tell us about some of the issues surrounding loans for exhibition? Suzanne, you're going to do that one, but I'll just start by, can I suggest something, Suzanne, just play? Yes. Because you talk about the pandemic and why we ended up doing this exhibition in its pandemic context, because that that's, that's the story of the loans as well. That is exactly the story, Alex. Um, uh, we have been talking for a little while uh, with some of our um, colleagues at the Aga Khan Museum for a couple of year, few years already about the possibility of doing something together. And then when the pandemic lockdown took place, international loans were frozen for institutions, for cultural heritage institutions. And so um, our, our colleague at the Aga Khan Museum, um, Phyllis Phillip, um, said her director was asking people for ideas. And so we wrote a proposal for a show in 48 hours uh, that would be at once global and local. We would draw on objects in collections in Southern Ontario, the Aga Khan Museum's own collection, the Royal Ontario Museum, the Fisher Rare Book and Manuscript Library, Western University, um, and um, a private collection in Toronto that had some objects we wanted to, to display. And um, so it was local in that sense. And, and, and it was a strange opportunity brought by the pandemic. I don't want to in any way minimize the suffering and hardship that people have been experiencing over the last couple of years. There's a lot to say about that, but it also opened unexpected doors, and this was one of them. Um, and in particular, the one aspect I just like to highlight very briefly is how how curators at these different institutions made every effort to move like heaven and earth in order to provide objects we could borrow. So, just to give one example, at the Royal Ontario Museum, there were I mean, it was a serious lockdown situation, and so the curators were really limited in what objects they could consider lending to us. We had a wish list, and in many cases, these were objects they just could not provide because there was no permission to open any of the things that were currently on display were off limits because there was no permission to go into the galleries and open things. Anything that wasn't already framed or otherwise mounted and ready to go was not eligible. So this made a very small range of objects. So the curators worked with us. We would say these, we would explain what we were trying to get at and they'd be like, oh, how about this? How about this? So when I describe this process as collaborative and iterative, I mean, that's something that I could talk about all day. All right, thank you. So uh, Claire had her hand up. Claire, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Sure, thank you so much, Dot. And thank you both for an absolutely wonderful presentation. This is such an amazing project and it's really cool to see where it's come. Um, so I have a lot of questions too, and I can see a lot of affinities actually between sort of late book, book history work later in the 20th century, especially on alternative forms, small publishers, um, you know, works outside of the mainstream that that really resonates a lot with a lot of what you're saying. Um, so my question for you is about project endings, the end of this, what does that look like for you both? This is obviously a massive project. It's actually a methodological project in many ways. Um, and I also really appreciated your sort of comments on collaborative writing and thinking and the affective dimensions of that. So I'm wondering if you thought about the end, what would the end look like for you both? Um, when might that happen? Does it end with the melon? That kind of thing. Just briefly, I love what you said, Claire, about methodology. I mean, I think that's the thing we've, it, it, it's not so much the specific research. I mean, the specific research findings are great and important, but uh, to my mind, if we've done something useful, it's to, to sort of give proof of concept of a particular method of working. And so from my point of view, it almost, it almost doesn't matter when it ends, right? Because it's the way of doing, right? And if others um, pick up on some elements and improve them and find ways to sort of build that out in, in better, even better ways, I mean, that's that's all we're hoping. As, from my point of view, that's what I'm hoping to accomplish. Uh, and Alex, I'm sure you have thoughts on that. Oop, you have to change your mic. Someone had to do it, and so I did it. Um, so the um, I would just reiterate, in a way, the same point. Maybe put it slightly slightly differently, um, but it's definitely the same point, which is that this point about it kind of not mattering when it ends. Now, it does matter to a certain extent. Um, there's work that we would love to keep doing and we will, we have sought and we will continue to seek and we have some prom promising possibilities, um, further funding for this project. Um, we, we also are working, because our network is, is so rich and diverse and full of such extraordinary people, we've been so lucky, um, we're also working with them as they look to develop their own next projects, whether it's our collaborators in Hamburg at the Centre for the Study of Manuscript Cultures, or it's our collaboration with um, folks in Sydney and at Wilfrid Laurier University in Islamabad and Lahore on, um, on Birchbark manuscript conservation um, of those um, of those books that are, that are showing up mostly at the, in the region around Peshawar in Pakistan and indeed in southern Afghanistan. So obviously a, 
a fraught part of the world, like a difficult part of the world for some of this work to get done, and yet it needs to be done locally. So we're working with them about how funding might come together there and so on. So as Suzanne says, like if people pick up on what we're doing, that's great. But there are also already seeds that have been sown for how that might happen um, for us and for others. Um, and uh, I, I, I was, I was going to say something else, but I'm, I'm not going to. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to say we, we hope it, we hope it will keep going. I am going to say something else. Sorry, I remember what it was. Um, and that is that I, it's a real problem of soft money, right? Which is to say money that comes to an end. So this is, this is work that requires a lot of time and energy. Suzanne and I couldn't do it on our own when we list the people who helped us do it. They're, these people are paid employees. This is their job. Like, you know, we're busy running institutes and universities and teaching and research, you know, and so on. We need, we need funding to make this sort of thing happen. And we're incredibly privileged in the people we've been able to employ to help us do that. Um, and and that, that's always, it's a stress and a worry because you're like, well, if it's so dependent on this funding, then how could it possibly continue if the funding is always, you know, every couple of years, every three years, it might disappear at any time. And I think um, that's, I mean, it's something that a lot of folks who've been working in the digital humanities space for, you know, for the last 20, 30 years have, have run up against. And I think that my own experiences um, with four previous funded Mellon projects, which involved um, software de development and, and various other things, it taught me a lot about, and we try but by developing a methodology. We we don't remove the problem of what where do we get the next chunk of, of funds from, um, but what we do is um, make it possible for the work to continue if we don't, because we've we've offered something that is free actually, which is just other folks can do this too um, if they want to. It's, yeah, it sounds slightly presumptuous, but it is true. Okay, that's it. Thank you both so much. That was amazing. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So before we move on to our next question, uh, Kai in the chat says not a question, but we are admiring the painting behind you on the wall, Alexandra. This it is a painting <laughs> of great meaning. It is a painting done by Charlotte Schreiber, who was one of the family who built this land on unceded territory in the size of the Credit First Nation next to the Missinahi in about 1880. And uh, she became Canada's first female member of the Royal Academy of the Arts. She's one of our most, she's one of Canada's most famous um, uh, female artists, especially um, the, the most famous of the 19th century. Um, and this is her dog, Puck. And she used to dress Puck up as a Turk. That's Puck being a Turk in affairs with a gun because, you know, Turks are always trying to shoot you and so on. So there's so much in there. I mean, the fact that he's called Puck as well, I could talk about, I could give another paper on this painting and my feelings about it. I'll tell you that one of the other joys of living in this house is we found in the attic some carvings of, um, of dragons that, uh, that are ascribed to, that, that there's a sticky note on them saying, you know, Charlotte Schreiber did these too. Um, and um, they're very, um, they're very neo-Gothic. This is, she was very interested in, um, in sort of in the gothic but that's a bit I think where the puck comes in anyway as I say I could talk, talk for ages and it, it's not unconnected to the things we're interested in um the that that quality that interest in the um in in the Ottomans and and their role in relation to British British imperialism and colonialism is all there in that little dog he's got an Ottoman pipe as well right it's got a Turkish pipe it's a quite offensive actually, but on some level, but it's also fascinating and um, in a piece of history, it helps us to think. So I thought it was just a cute painting of a dog. Yeah, I know. It's like much deeper asked. than that. Like, oh, come on, this is a meeting of academics, you know, like we're <laughs> <I> know. all, <laughs> you can't stop us. <laughs> there was a question about CT and MSI as well. Yeah, that's, a, yeah, that's the next question. So Caitlin wants to know about your decision to do CT imaging rather than MSI. So one thing is we didn't actually we didn't dis, we didn't make the distinction we didn't do that kind of work um, here at University of Toronto but um, well not at U of T but we did do some of that kind of work um, at, with our collaborators in other locations um, and in particular um, we did early on in the project some amazing work um, with um, uh, with the Library of Congress's conservation science division um, and we had uh, with Fenelle France in the lead there as our as our main collaborator and her team um, and we used MSI um, as well as um, other spectroscopical I'm sure that's not quite how you say that um, spectro 
yeah, whatever, those methods, um, in order to, to sort of look at the, the bindings that we were interested in. This sort of throws us back to the fact that, you know, when, when we started conceiving of this project, because I have, have a long-standing interest in book binding, we were sort of conceiving of it as a, a, a project that was about the book and the Silk Roads, but that would be particularly focused on codices and the ways that they were bound. And um, that, that has evolved for all the reasons I hope our paper make clear that actually that the codex is definitely a fascinating technology and we have worked on it, but we are interested in, in books understood much more broadly than that. Um, but to come back to the scientific methods, what we worked out was that if you're really interested in binding, some of those other methods that are used a lot in art history, that are used a lot in text analysis and so on, are it's not that they don't have tremendous potential, but there aren't the, um, there aren't the standardized data sets to compare the findings um, that you get when you, test, um, when you test the exterior of the book in those sorts of ways. Um, so that you know what it is you're looking at. And the other thing too is that they don't penetrate in the same way. And so the, these radiographical x-ray type technologies um, and in particular CT, just because the quality of the images you get enables you to do things potentially. And we, and we knew that the technology was there but that it had been very focused on text recovery. So the work of Brent Seals unwrapping the Engetti scroll is, is perhaps the, the most famous touchstone example. Um, we were like, this technology we think can be developed. And as I say, we're still working with our collaborators to develop it, um, to look at, you know, sewing structures, um, to look at the, the layers of fabric or the layers of board and, um, and paste downs and so on inside a book that you, that you can't see with the naked eye unless you disbind the book. And as any binding historian will tell you, the minute you've disbound the book, you've, you've erased parts of its history. So um, we, we really, I mean, there are other possibilities that go back to um, textual analysis too. And again, that some multispectral imaging and other kinds of spectroscopical work um, can enable you to do. But again, if you're too deep inside a binding, they can't. And that is, for example, reading text that's on fragments of uh, manuscript or printer books that have been used within the binding as a spine lining or as part of paste boards and so on. Um, we haven't actually yet done that, um, but we have seen bits and bobs of text inside our books on micro CT and we, we do intend to go that direction too. So the answer is, you know, we'll use any tool. Um, we've also done a lot of work with EZMS, so proteomic analysis to do speciation of, um, of animal substrates in particular in books. Um, but, uh, but this one was one that it, it captured our fancy, and I suppose, and it was also one we were able to work on during the pandemic, um, because, well, sort of during the pandemic, we got quite a bit of work done on it before, um, but, um, but it was one, when a number of labs shut down, this was still something we could do some work on as well, so lots of reasons there. I guess add to that, Alex, or invite you to talk more about it. Uh, we were, I think, very creative in figuring out what to do about the Williams Birch Park manuscript, right? If travel had been happening, we would have handled that one way, but it wasn't happening. So what do we do? I, I, that's a good question because um, I, I believe I was quite busy, unfortunately, running the University of Toronto. Oh, no. <laughs> we, we, I mean, did all really we did it with that. Harvard, we did it locally, right? Yeah, like, the, you know, local, right? I mean, that's one of the things we learned over the last little while, not just that you had to have a plan A and a plan B and a plan C all the time, but that you had to be ready to come up with creative solutions, right, um, on the fly. So when this Birchbark manuscript um, at Williams College that Alex mentioned was found, it, under other circumstances, we would probably have tried to see if we could bring the book to some particular um, collaborator we'd already been working with, or, or we would have gone to spend time. Like there are all kinds of ways we might have approached that. Under the circumstances, what we could do is put together local partners and find ways to facilitate connections so that the, the, the object could have its circle gathered around them. I guess you could say in a hybrid way, right? Some people were physically there with the object and others were involved in looking at it um, from afar. So um, that's maybe a good it's example. Actually, it's a tribute to the slight look of panic that I got just then when I was like, I don't know how we did that because <laughs> other people did it. Like we were just like, that's awesome. Please send us the results. But you're right that we did a lot of work. And I say we, it was really um, Jess Lockhart in particular, another big shout out to her um, and others who we were working with, the experts in CT here in Toronto, working with the folks down at Williams to identify the people who they work with there. And that's very much what we're, we look to do in say a place like Pakistan, 
where um, the Lahore Institute for Management Sciences, so LUMS, really the major, one of the most prestigious universities in the country, is super keen to do this kind of work. And, you know, when we when we started the project, the idea was, well, I guess we'll all have to fly to Lahore and we'll have to, and actually we, we don't think like that anymore. And, um, and I think there are so many benefits to the fact we don't think like that anymore. How do you build infrastructure in place um, and how do you do that in a hybrid ways um, it's been so the project is really fundamentally and the findings and the methods are fundamentally shaped by pandemic circumstances as Suzanne said um, you know we don't want to suggest the pandemic you know, I hate talking about the silver lining of the pandemic but what it has had is lessons like we've learned from it and that has been um, very transformational Oh, there we go. Here's the list of all the people. Yeah. I know all of them except for Greg Lynn. So if Greg is here, I do apologize for not naming him. He's um, from the Center for Nanoscale Systems. I was so excited when I realized that I could legitimately say to members of my family who are engineers that I was now working in the nanosphere. Um, so they, I don't think they really believe me, but you know, it's good. Yeah. So if there aren't any other immediate questions, I have a question. Um, so I think your, your focus on the building of the network is really interesting. And, um, and I'm wondering what lessons you have that you would give to other people thinking about building similar kinds of, of networks, like what kinds of lessons did you learn? Clearly it was a big major part of your project and how, how do you go about doing that? Such a good question in a way. Um, so I would actually return, I'd like to hear what Suzanne has to say, but I'd like to return to the point I made at the beginning about trust, um, that um, that you you don't form trust quickly or easily. Like trust is not trust is not transactional. Trust is about reciprocity. It's about a, you know, giving and a taking. And I think about the relationship that we have with Aga Khan, for example, and with Felice Philip in particular, um, that relationship began before this project began in the sense that Suzanne had uh, established a relationship with Felice partly through the Islamic um, Center at the University of Toronto. And then she was like, Alex, I think you'd like Felice, we should go to lunch. And we went to lunch. Um, and then, you know, six months later, we did have funding or a year later, we did have funding for this project. And so I invited Felice because Suzanne introduced me to have a cup of coffee. And we just talked, we just talked about what she cared about and what I cared about. And we found we found a shared vocabulary, which wasn't quick because she comes from an art historical curatorial museum studies tradition, right? And I'm an academic with a background in English like William Caxton and Chaucer or whatever. So we had to talk around each other for a while until we could find that vocabulary. And, you know, and on it went, you know, emails and, and then the pandemic and Zoom meetings and just, just this kind of, this, this iterative process of building trust until you get to a point where you have a great idea and you think, who could I ask about this great idea? Well, I think it's great um, and see if it really is great. And you think I could give Feliz a call. That, I think what I would say from that is trust, reciprocity, patience, and an understanding that relationship building takes time. That it's not a question of, you know, calling someone up and being like, oh, I see you're doing this work. I would like to work with you. Here is some money. It's not that, that, that it is not. I mean, you can do that, um, but no, it doesn't work the same way. Suzanne, do you want to build on that? Yeah, no, I agree with everything you've said. And I just like add a little bit more onto that. One of the things um, when you were describing the relationship we built, as, in particular with um, Felice Philip at the Khan Museum, it, it came to be, there was that relationship, that trust building that you described. And then as we began working together very closely, like meeting on Zoom, like frequently through the week, right? Like, tremendous amounts of time we spent together. So much so that we got to the point where, um, you know, it was difficult to know whose whose idea was what, or like, or somebody would suggest something, and the other person would have been about to suggest it. That is, we really came to be in a shared space, which, as you say, is a, is something that gets established through trust. And you know, again, coming back to um, the way in which I described the Birch Park manuscript uh, workshop that we've been thinking about for a long time, and I think in retrospect, I'm like really wisely did not move on immediately, and we've instead been patient and thought about it for a while. Um, you know, our understanding is that we need to begin with the land we're on, which means not just sort of assuming that we can think about birch bark manuscripts in different parts of the world on an equal footing, like we put them in their epistemological containers and deal with them, right? We're not thinking about it that way. We're thinking about, okay, we're, if we're on um, land, uh, Great Lakes and Eastern Woodlands lands, right? We need to have an understanding of 
how birch bark is thought of, how the birch tree is thought of, what people who have relationships to the land we're on think we should be doing, what to what extent is, you know, how can we be good partners um, and um, in a good relationship with them with regard to the work on those manuscripts. And then we can grow that outward, right, to these other regions of the world, and it was beginning locally. And it may have seemed to some people, I think, a little extraneous that I was, you know, drawing attention to working with NASIP, the um, uh, Native American Indigenous Studies Initiative at Princeton, or the Muncie Language Symposium. You might be like, well, it's completely unrelated. I'm like, no, for me, uh, uh, doing that work over the last couple of years is absolutely necessary um, for what we want to do specifically around the Birch Park Manuscript Workshop, but also just like in general. Um, and so that, that's the kind of thing Alex is getting at, like trust and reciprocity. I mean, if we're going to get anywhere, that, that's how we're going to do it. You should also say um, we are very, very lucky in the support we get from the Mellon Foundation because they get it. They're not asking us to deliver. I mean, we had, I should say, we are publishing scholarly articles on lots of our findings and so on. And it's part of what we're doing. But um, but there's an understanding on the part of the um, it's now called it's now public knowledge team was scholarly communications team public knowledge team that um that the myth that the value is in the method that the value is in the seeds that you plant that it takes time that it requires patience that it's iterative that you're not always going to produce a concrete result quickly or indeed even even at all and that but that's the work that's good work they they get that and i I don't know any other um, any other funding, or well, I'm sure there are other funding bodies, perhaps in other areas, but for, for we humanists, that it's absolutely vital. I don't know what we do without it. That's that's great and really helpful. Thank you. Um, there are there's discussion in the chat about the environmental benefits too of of lessening air travel. I think probably all of us have thought about this over the past year and a half through the pandemic, but it it has made a huge difference and also. I'll just say for myself, it's been great being, a, I've been able to attend a whole lot, just mm -hmm. more things because I don't have to travel to get there. Um, and this sort of raises another question, which is related to the funding aid, funding. And was there, I imagine when you put the grant together, you had a lot of money set aside for travel. Mm -hmm. Were they really nice about letting you reallocate that money to do other things then? Yeah, yeah. and as Jess uh, says in the chat, what we reallocated it to was our collaborators internationally. So we were able to provide funds to a team in um, Kerala in India who are doing work um, on conservation and cataloging of a really important collection of palm leaf potis and other, uh, other manuscripts, um, which, you know, we, we 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 didn't plan to do that at the beginning because we actually didn't know those folks at the beginning. Um, we do now, and that was amazing. Um, but it was also that we just had a shift in mindset. We were like, you know, build it locally, build infrastructure locally. And no, I mean, again, the I actually think a lot of funding agencies were pretty great about these things. And I don't think Mellon was the only one, but they were amazingly supportive. Just like, you know, if you can still achieve the the your goals um, as you've as you've abstractly described them then go like just keep doing it and so it's actually been um yeah again the, the pandemic the, this is a pandemic project um, which is kind of interesting in the sense of course the pandemic is a global phenomenon and that's why it's a pandemic project and that's part of what gave it a different kind of and it frankly much more global shape have we just been you know flying into ethiopia looking at some manuscripts talking to some folks, flying back, we would have felt like we were doing a global project, but actually we wouldn't have been doing one in the same way we ended up doing one by sitting at home, like in our in our bedrooms quite often, um, doing a global project and really doing it globally, bringing more and more people in from around the world. It was amazing. We've been very lucky. I mean, you know, pandemic notwithstanding. Yeah, and it feels like that also uh, addresses the things you said earlier about reciprocity and trust you know, that you were able to um, share that much more um, mm -hmm. and, and help other people do their work with the funding, you know, the funding that you have. One of the things the pandemic, I think, has done for lots of people, um, it's certainly done this in my, in my community here in the Peel region and in um, Canada, which is the epicenter of the pandemic in Canada in terms of numbers and um, caseload. We have the airport, we have all the supply chain logistics here, et cetera. And um, one of the things it's done is it's just, it's flipped people around to a, um, to uh, principles of care and community, right? That, and locality, right? Take care of the people here right now because that's that's the best work you can do right now. And um, and I think that has infused 
uh, that's infused what it is we're doing. I, you know, I think of those folks in Kerala, I, I hope one day I get to meet them, but on some level, it, I mean, in person, um, but on some level, it doesn't matter if, if they're able to provide care for the objects and for each other and for the work and for the knowledge in situ, that's what matters, so. Yeah, let's add a word to that. I agree completely else. It is, I think what's happened is we've learned how much we can do, as you say, sitting at home in our bedrooms and thinking about the local, thinking about the people who are right around us and exercising responsibilities of care toward them. But it's also offered us the opportunity to understand what are the things that we can only do together? Like, when is it important to be together in a place? And this was, I felt this really strongly um, about a week and a half ago when I came up to Toronto, traveling for the first time, right, since the pandemic began. Um, to the Aga Khan Museum because we have been all this time working on the project like together like like half the half the working hours in the week were devoted to this project for periods of time um it put together on zoom right and looking at images of the objects and laying out the design of the galleries in this little like dollhouse type program with the designer uh, at least myself and the designer and um and then I got there and walked in and it was real like there were actual objects that had tears in my eyes. It was like overwhelming. And then again, on the Saturday when they actually opened and there were people in the galleries and watching them see the objects and be with them, you know? So, so it's, it's opened our eyes to something I think that we've taken for granted. And now we can distinguish between what are the things we can do remotely? What can we, what can we build outward sitting in our bedrooms? But, but when and why is it important to be in a place together? And again, I feel like the Birch Park Workshop for us is gonna be very powerful in that respect because we're understanding it's being tied to the particular land we're gonna be on. Yeah, Suzanne, I may actually get in touch with you off this call if that's okay, because I had a quite different experience with an exhibition, the photo behind me. I had an exhibition that installed in the middle of March of last year and never opened and never got an audience. And so I would be really interested in talking with you more about, about these experiences. Cause I think there's really something, I've been thinking about this a lot um, about what, what needs to be in person and what needs to be digital. And what you actually, what you said um, in, in the talk about the, you know, you have the digital, the digital part of the exhibition that did something different from the, the physical and that. And I was sort of forced into, into doing that. So. Oh yeah, um, no, I really like to talk about that together. Dot and just it, just one detail I didn't say is, you know, when we were first planning, this is sort of in the spring going into the summer. Part of the logic of having a well thought out digital exhibit for us was honestly we didn't know if we'd be able to be open in the fall. We didn't know if anybody would ever, would ever be able to come in and see the exhibit because of the kind of experience you're describing. And so we were trying to imagine a spectrum of like maximally open, and then the exhibit can the digital exhibit can be a supplement, a counterpart, a sibling. It can do some different kinds of work. Um, to being the only way in um, and, and anything along that spectrum, right? So, you know, and, and therefore we, we feel like we're kind of, we're, we're supple, right? We're, we're ready to sort of be where we need to be, where our circumstances are placing us. Now I'd like to hear more about that. Okay, all right. It, I think Nick has a question. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you both so much. This is, this has just uh, been so utterly fascinating and it's such an amazing project. And um, I was wondering about many of the um, manuscript and, and book traditions that you look at, you know, have, have kind of very active and vibrant um, continuity today in, in kind of scribal culture, manuscript culture. And I was wondering, you know, if there are any things in particular that you, that you learned um, by kind of um, getting to know and questioning and, 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 and investigating kind of current manuscript cultures that, that might sort of be a uh, represent continuity or persistence with, uh, with, with, you know, some of these objects that you examine, which, you know, some of them are, you know, quote unquote medieval, some of them are, um, are, are, are much more recent. Um, so just any thoughts you might have about that? I can say a tiny um, bit about that specifically to do with the exhibit, but then I'd love to hear what you have to say, Alex. You know, for the exhibition at the Aga Khan Museum, when we were imagining maximally open, right? When we were super optimistic before the Delta variant stuff, right? Um, we were like, we can put on book making workshops. We can create spaces at the, and the museum is really pro this idea. They love doing this kind of stuff. That would enable people to sort of think about the craft practices in a, you know, think with their hands and not just by looking, right? And that hasn't been possible, right? So the restrictions are such that we still do have to be cautious. A beautiful um, sort of, I don't know how to do it. I wish I had it in front of me. Uh, a beautiful little handout that shows you different book binding forms was made available that Melissa Morton and Patricia Bentley worked on together with um, our, our creator partner, Felice Phillips. Um, and it's actually in the form of an Islamic book binding. But we hand these out 
with the ticketing, right? So that there's no picking up and putting back, right? And so this book binding hands-on thing that we imagine we can't do. So, so, so we're, we were really hungry to do that kind of work in the setting of the exhibition, but we're not there right this minute. And Alex, I'm sure you have a lot more to say on that topic. Yeah, lots of thoughts. Um, we, um, I think I'll just, I'll focus on the fact that a few years ago to 2018, um, I was really lucky to um, come to, a, to attend a conference here at University of Toronto, Mississauga, led by Mississauga's the, new, uh, Mississauga's the Credit um, First Nation and um, by some of our faculty here at UTM. And there were a lot of high school teachers involved. And one of the workshops was a brilliant um, bookmaker and artist called Philip Cote, um, who's part of the Tecumseh Collective, who's an Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe man here in, in the region, um, making birch, you know, preparing birchmark for, um, for, for inscription, preparing it and, and showing how that worked. And everyone got to be hands on and, and talk about it and so on. It was extraordinary. And that was um, that was a that was a really like it was a very important light bulb on moment for me, in part because I, I have to admit like it makes a difference to me when I'm looking at uh, you know I go to an exhibition for example and I'll look at the date and if it says 1800 I'm like mm, just, I'm not that interested like it, the older it is the more excited I get right because the fourth century I'm just like I'm over the moon like I have some kind of and this this moment was a well. I mean, yes, you're allowed to be interested in particular moments in history more than others. You know, that's one of the joys of being a humanist. Um, but as Suzanne says, there is a, there, there are there is knowledge about that that has moved through time in the form of people's people's doing as well as their knowing, right? And so you're actually there's a there's a privileging of one way of knowing the past um, in the way I'm thinking that um, that isn't even necessary, even if I am only interested in the past. Um, and so that, to me, one of the ways I now, when I see, a, you know, when I think about a book that's from the early 20th century is a knowledge that that book is both telling a story often, you know, and our, and because of our interests about kinds of cultural encounter and exchange and kinds of convergent evolution of practice and so on, about the now, about the local, about the here, this moment and so on, and that that is important and that is a story that needs to be told um, or kept and, and stewarded for the future, um, but also it, it, can t it tells a, a story of the deep past as well, right? So it tells a story of the way, you know, of both similar and different practices going back in time. And that, that is actually part of undoing that narrative that I spoke about, the Gutenberg myth narrative, right? That there are these moments in time. There are moments in time that are transformational. I don't doubt that. I, I don't think that, I personally don't think the invention of the reinvention of printing in the West was one of those moments. I think that the European, um, uh, the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade and the um, and and belligerent European colonialism at that same moment was the more important change, but um, so, so there are transformational moments, of course, but the um, the idea that that a that a book is most interesting because it represents that kind of transformational moment rather than it represents these long traditions of different cultures trying to keep and and preserve what matters most to them, what they want to see preserved across space and time that, yeah. So that was a very abstract answer to the question, um, which is also that, you know, we've learned from bookmakers in lots of different ways, not as much as we would have if, if it weren't for the pandemic, because we haven't had to do that embodied kind of, we were going to have Georgios Budalis come over and do book binding workshops with us and, and all learn how to do Byzantine bindings. We didn't get to do that. Um, there were all sorts of things we missed out on, but um, but the the spirit is is still there and infusing the work that um, that we're doing. And that is, I think, an excellent thing to end on. It is one thirty, actually one thirty one. So it is time for us to go. Thank you so much this for your excellent presentation and then the conversation afterwards. This is just I'm coming out of this with so much to think about, and I'm sure everyone else is too.